We are recording. Now everybody pretend to be professional okay. and adult like. <laughs> Fuck this shit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Atta boy. <laughs> so fast. Jacob. 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 <laughs> Jacob. Matt, are you trying to serenade Jacob? <laughs> I am. I am. He does this. He does this every week for me, and I, I love it. <laughs> Jacob, the day I met you, my heart was born a true saint for you. Not sure quite what that means, but I guess it just means that I love you. That was beautiful. I'm 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 shedding a tear over here. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> all week, folks. All week. <laughs> we are joined by one of my favorite people that I have yet to meet in real life, but I've spent a lot of time with over the airwaves, whether they be phone or internet. Today, she posted a wonderful article. Giving you the lowdown on Team Russia, what to expect. She is a big fan, despite being American, she is a big fan of all things Russian. Russian culture, Russian language, and yes, one very special Russian hockey player. His name? Well, it depends on who you ask. Some say Gino, some say Evgeny. What I've heard him say his own name, and I can't say it like he he does, but I can use the same letters. <laughs> Evgeny Malkin. <laughs> Evgeny. Y- How? It's like Y E, like Evgeny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> How you do Malkin? <laughs> Mal- Malkin, like uh, Evgeny, Evgeny Malkin. Malkin? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Her name is Marina Marota. <laughs> Marina Marota. It just rolls right off the top. Well, no, it's a, I, I gotta correct you. It's Marina Marotta, like Hakuna Matata. So <laughs> she is Marina Marotta Hakuna Matata. Hey, yeah, I like that. <laughs> Marina Marotta. I like it. Yeah, it's it's easier to remember than it looks like, you know. It's a good philosophy. Well, thanks for having me. Welcome thank you. to the show. Thank you for coming on. Marina, I have to ask you the same question I've asked everyone who's come on this show. All right. Will you please share with us your hockey beginnings? Sure. Um, I guess it's a little weird. To give you, like, background, my mom has a best friend who she has had since she was three. <laughs> this is relevant whenever you ask her about her best friend. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I say the same thing about my cat. <laughs> so, um, so her best friend, um, you know, they grew up together and when she got married, she moved out to Arizona and, um, you know, whatever, they stayed best friends. Um, so when I was 10, my dad passed away and my mom, you know, needed her best friend. So we flew out to Arizona and her family, uh, Laura, my mom's best friend, they, you know, had a guest house and Laura's husband um, and her, like, they had two sons and Mark coached hockey and then the two sons, Kyle and Tyler, they both played hockey. Um, they had a lot of money. Um, they had a full-size roller hockey rink, like, in their backyard. That's so, you awesome. Know, I come, so I come to visit and I'm 10 and I'm maybe the biggest tomboy you've ever met wearing my backwards hat and my Blink-182 shirt. That's so um, cool. <laughs> And I'm like really, I'm like really into this. Like they're into paintball, dirt biking, and hockey. And I'm like, let me be one of the boys. Yes. So, um, so we were, my mom and I stayed with them for about a week. And, um, when the boys would go off to school, I'd like put their gear on and go skate around in their, on their rink. And, um, I don't know, Laura, Laura, um, we stayed in their guest house and Laura got me this like little package like a little like welcoming gift and it happened to have like a Keith Kachuk jersey you know one of the good old the good old Aztec coyote jerseys and Mark and Mark took me to my first hockey game while I was out there with the boys I remember 
I'm pretty scarred for life from the story. He told me that a girl got hit in the face by a puck and died and when we went to the game, so I was I was really alert and you know, I went to the game, loved it, got myself a little hat and a mini stick and I guess I've just been a hockey fan ever since. It's kind of weird I got introduced to hockey in Arizona being from Chicago. I thought you said that like the the girl that died was at that game and I was about ready to no. go on a totally different tangent. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't even know why I brought that up. I think it's just cuz I'm so scarred from hearing that that like I'll never every time I go to a hockey game I'm like, "You need to pay attention." Like <laughs> <laughs> Like I get real mad at people. I'm like, you're going to get hit in the face with a puck, and I'm not going to feel bad for you. Like, I don't know this. I'm telling you this now. I'm not calling 911. I'm just going to stand over you and tell you I told you so. No, I'm I'm a little bit of a hockey snob when I go to games when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I love the fact you mentioned the Keith Kachuk Aztec jersey because I love Keith Kachuk growing up. Like, he was one of my favorite players. He was he was my absolute favorite player because obviously because I had his jersey, but then like um, yeah, obviously it was before everyone like called him fat and stuff and made fun of him. Yeah. and he was really <laughs> fucking great. Like he, he really was fantastic. Was. Yes, but can you spell his name? It's T K A. Don't make me go on a spelling bee. T <laughs> K A. You did the same thing to me. I don't fucking know. Don't make, I'll Google it. Like I can cheat. I'm just trying not to. It's but fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. hey, Keith to Keith to Chuck. I, I and I can barely say it. Keith to Chuck. Cover man for NHL '98, the very first N64 video game I ever had. I actually NHL didn't. Breakaway '98 was the shit. Yeah, it was pretty great. I loved it. That's awesome. So they they played roller hockey or did they play ice hockey? The boys. Yeah, they played zone. roller hockey. It was funny too. So Kyle like. He was a year older than me. His entire room was like Colorado Avalanche. And then Tyler, who is my age, he he was like the Coyotes fan. So I was like, "What? Like tell me more. Like who are these teams?" But yeah, they were they played roller hockey cuz it was Arizona and obviously like it'd be hella expensive to upkeep right. like ice um there. But they they were like, like a traveling team. I remember they just had like a million trophies and like they went to Canada. And when I was 10, that was, like, absurd. I was like, what? You've been to Canada how many times? Like, <laughs> That's awesome. How did you develop your, your fandom, though? So, other than Keith Kachuk, I mean, go on. I guess, like, I guess I got, like, that's how I got introduced to it. And then, um, you know, I went home to, like, Chicago area. And I, I remember, like, begging to watch games. So I would, like, watch games whenever <laughs> they were on. Which was few and far between. Um, but, and then it kind of like fell off the radar, to be honest. Um, no one in my family is really into hockey. And my, I don't know, my mom, like, you know, like my mom's not like really into sports. So it was just kind of like my own hobby. And then when I ended up going to Northern Michigan, uh, university for undergrad, everyone was hockey crazy. And we had a D1 team. And everyone was, like, crazy into Detroit. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, let me get. <laughs> and um, so I, I really, uh, I started I started watching uh, the Blackhawks a lot. And I just, I just kind of, like, put, like, way too much energy into it. And then I kind of became, like, obsessed girl with hockey. So, <laughs> it's spark- so it sparked back up when I, when I was... Like the end of high school, beginning of my freshman year of college. Were you there in 2008, 2009, Stanley Cups? You, when they won the cup in 2010? Right. No, so or like. Before that. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a big fan of Malkin. And so I was just wondering what that was like when you oh, were. Oh, no, when actually. When you were there so at it's, school. No, so it's, it's funny. Like, I actually, I, I hate myself for this. Like, so I got into hockey and like, I remember watching playoff games like my senior year of high school and but then I like didn't really care. And then when I was a freshman, I remember like watching the Black I think the Blackhawks made it when I was a freshman, but they didn't make it very far. And once they got out, I like didn't watch it. And so, yeah, like I got really into Malkin watching the 2010 Olympics and I literally hate myself for not like I didn't care about Detroit cuz I like 
was told to hate Detroit at the time. So I was like, no, I don't want to watch this. So I totally didn't even watch it. Like, I hate, like, I, <laughs> I, like, I, I, I know, like, I didn't even watch them win the Stanley Cup. And then, um, I don't know, in, once, like, 2010 rolled around, I kind of just got into the sport as a whole and not as much just into the Blackhawks. And that was when, yeah, my Malkin obsession started. I started to really appreciate the Red Wings. One of my best friends who, like, I ended up living with in undergrad, um, like her, her dad played for like, um, what's his name? Little Caesars, uh, Mike Illich's team. And yes. like, wow. yeah, like she, her dad had a picture with the Stanley Cup. And so she was this huge Red Wings fan. So I couldn't like help, but like love them. So then everyone just started to hate me because I like couldn't pick a team. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. But, uh, nah, you're yeah, fine. I, I totally miss the, uh, 2009 Stanley Cup. Uh, Penguins, so I hate myself. <laughs> See, I figured just when Detroit beat the Penguins and then they lost to the Penguins, I think that's how it went down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Detroit won in 08 and then the Pens won in Pens won. I figured Northern Michigan would have been all for it and just been like been a super hockey craze that Detroit won. I didn't, I didn't realize that they hate Detroit. Everyone was really into the playoffs, but like you have to remember that we like left school. For, like, before, oh, like, the finals came up, you know? Fair. That's fair, yeah. So I was back in Illinois by the time, like, the Stanley Cup was even being given out. Yeah. And, like, I was still, like, more of just a Blackhawks fan where I didn't care. But now I would hate myself if, like, I did that. Like, what do you mean, like? That's hilarious. Cool that you got into, uh, that you really found your favorite player through the Olympics, too. Because I think you're the first person I've ever heard say that. I, yeah. I honestly, like, I, people ask me that all the time. They're like, why are you so obsessed with Malkin? Cause like, I have, like, you guys saw me earlier, like, I have a penguin shirt on. Mm-hmm. And people are mm-hmm. like, why do you like the penguins? I hate the penguins. Especially people, like, in, in Michigan. And I'm like, no, it's not the penguins. It's, it's just Malkin. And, um, but I don't even know, like, how it started. I think I've just always had, like, a fascination for, like, European stuff. And, like, the Russian accent is just, like, this thing that, like, I can't handle. And then, you know, <laughs> you watch Malkin and you get mesmerized. So I think it's just, like, the combo of, like, Russian excellent hockey player. I don't really know, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most unique entrance into hockey I've ever heard of. And it's wonderful. It's, it's so refreshing. Yeah, it's, it's all pretty, like, happenstance. Like... I happened to be in a few different predicaments that kind of like led me to hockey, and I just kind of like ran with it. I so think, why do like, you stay? Well, I've always found like sports to be a really like great outlet. Like when I was in high school, I was super super into baseball, and I'd always watch it, and I could like zonk. Mm-hmm. Um, but I only mm-hmm. liked the Cubs, and then when I started watching hockey, <laughs> like I could watch any team, and I could just like. Like, like, zonk. And I just, I I don't know how else to say it. No, no, um, it's a great word. But, like, it just makes me feel like everything's gonna be okay. (laughs) And (laughs) I, I, I just, I can't leave it. My, my mom criticizes me all the time. That's why I started my, my hockey blog a few years ago, because she's like, I can't handle it. All you talk about is hockey. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm just like, Oh, like, I, cause I don't know, like, I just, it's just one of those things, like, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but it just, it's so easy to love, like. Yeah, yes, so 100% yes. Like, a like I don't know how you can't, like, love it, and, like, want more of it, like, all the time. It's, I, it's I an obsession. It's a fixation. It's, it's a obsession. it's a lifestyle. It's, it is. It really is. Like I get it. Like I I get why people like wrap their whole entire life around it. Cause it's fun. Like it's awesome. It, like it makes it makes me feel good whenever. Like like Matt, you know, I've been having a pretty bad week, but yeah. I have Olympic hockey to look forward to, and that makes things like okay. And, and as you both know, I've had a pretty rough start to the year. Well, I've had the stadium series and now the Olympics and you guys. And it's been, it's been absolutely wonderful. Jake, uh, one of our previous conversations during the week, I was telling you, maybe it was last week since this is technically the beginning of this week, that 
I was able to park my baggage at the door at Yankee Stadium, right on River Avenue, and just fully get engulfed in the atmosphere. And I was able, I mean, yep. it's not hockey, but I was able to do the same thing for the Super Bowl. And man, coming back to reality was, was a lot easier once I got to get away from it for a few hours. Especially hockey is the greatest way to just escape from reality and just immerse yourself 100% in one thing. And just no matter what the outcome is, it's always so much better when you're done with it. You just feel so much happy if you win, and then even if you lose, you you still feel the twinge of defeat. And but you still, it's like, man, that was fun. Do you guys like orient towards one team, or do you are you guys like more player oriented? Well, at least in my in- instances, I'm very I'm a diehard St. Louis Blues fan. Oh, okay. So I've been I've been with them. I've been following them since I was for literally as long as I can remember. But especially that's why the- you like Keith Kachuk. <laughs> It's one of the reasons why I like Keith Kachuk, but it's also because I met, I have, I have him in hockey card form on every single team he's played for, except for the Atlanta Thrashers. But I don't think they actually made an Atlanta Thrashers card because he went back with the Blues after he was traded away. I don't. I, this is just one weird obsession that I had. Is like I had his hockey card. I was like, oh, I really like him, and then he became a Blue, and I was really excited. But now that I'm up here in Milwaukee and it's deep in Chicago land, specifically Hawks fans, and then. I know fans who are Avalanche fans and Minnesota Wild fans and Penguins fans and Flyer fans and Devils fans and Rangers fans. It's just yeah, yeah. I've I've become more and more engrossed in hockey as a whole more so than just the St. Louis Blues. Yeah. Doesn't it make it better like when you can appreciate other teams? I that's yes. always my that's always my argument for people who get mad at me when like you know, the Blackhawks will be playing the Red Wings, and I'm just like, wow, that was an awesome goal, like, from Datsuk or something. And they'll get mad at me, like, as a Blackhawk fan, and I'm just like, well, I think I'm enjoying the game more than you are. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. As a guy who's uh, on Long, a Rangers fan on Long Island in New York, I, you know, I have two other teams that I, I have to compete with, two other fan bases that I have to compete with, but... I have I have an anecdote for you, Marina, that uh, will partner with what you're talking about. So back in 04, what I hear is that the Yankees won the first three games of the ALCS, and then the Red Sox won the next four to beat the Yankees in horrible, dr- horribly dramatic fashion, and they won the World Series that year. That's what they tell me. I don't really remember it. It's kind of like the Vancouver games. Like The game ended after Parise scored is what I think happened. What I'm saying is, after that experience, I stopped looking at these teams as something to hate. Because the truth was, is that that 2004 series, the Yankees and Red Sox, was the most exciting thing I had seen to date. And it still ranks as one of the one or two or three most exciting things I've ever seen. And it all had to do with the fact that it was a rival and it was absolutely dramatic. And so I stopped looking at these potential rivals as something to hate and rather as something to appreciate, something to look forward to. Because the truth is, is that these rival games, whether they are a rival in your own mind or on a more grandiose scale, those are simply the games that you get up for and you go and circle the date as, I'm going to see this game one way or another. Yeah. And so you stop worrying about that that you're losing to the Red Sox and you start appreciating the entirety of the game itself. Mostly agree with that. The thing I don't agree with is that yeah, it's like yes, I circle games well let me let me use like tomorrow. I've circled the women's US Canada game. I've cir- got that circled up in my calendar and I've already got the alarm set for six fifteen so that way I can wake up and watch it. And mm-hmm. yes I would appreciate that it's Canada versus U.S., but I would be a little upset if we lose. Like, I want to win because, after all, it, it is the, it's our, our rivals and I want to win. But yeah, I get what you're saying. It's, you appreciate the fact that it's a great game because of the, uh, because of the rivalry and it makes it just a little bit better than every other game. But at the same time, I still kind of want to win. So I'll be, but, but it trans, but it transcends from there down to the rest of the teams and the rest of the games where you stop looking at us versus them and you start yeah. 
and you start watching it in a duality of enjoying the game in its entirety so that when that's that breaks your heart with a with a sick dangle you can still go holy shit i actually just saw that i that, think oh. that i think that that's valid as long as it's not the playoffs <laughs> yeah i still refuse to draft adam adam henrique or you don't like henrique well i mean 2012 <laughs> henry scored in what was it double overtime yeah, look, I'm not saying that in fantasy sports I don't stay away from some teams or some players. Like, I still don't want Adam Henrique on my team after he eliminated the Rangers in 2012. After the 2001 World Series, I never drafted Randy Johnson or Kurt Schilling again or Tony Walmack or Luis Gonzalez. Were you playing fantasy baseball in 2001? Oh, yeah. What? They had the what? internet in 2001? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's... I think I was still on dial-up in 2001. I don't... I think we had just gotten off of dial-up. I was 14 then, so yeah. I I for sure had to have been on dial-up. I think I was... Yeah, if I was 11, I think I was still on dial-up until I was, like, 13. Man, 2001... I I mean, and then I was on AIM, but I definitely wasn't involved with fantasy anything at that age. I was definitely playing backyard baseball at that age. I think I was still playing Pokemon, so I mean, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> when do you do you really ever stop playing Pokemon? Let's be honest. No, my I, I have a nine year old brother, and I like, you know, that game is that game is still hot. So Pokemon Red emulator on my laptop. So you guys are weird. Joke. Go outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gears of War, Super Smash Brothers, or going outside. Alrighty. Now here's the fun question. You said you were a Cubs fan and you absolutely loved baseball. Do, yeah. Being a St. Louis Cardinals fan, I will say that it's the only time I'll root for the Cubs is when they're in the World Series because I want Because Chicago. we're awful. No, because I want Chicago well, to burn that. to the ground when the Cubs win the World Series. <laughs> I want to help go down and riot and burn down Chicago with everybody else when, when the Cubs oh. win. Seriously. No, like, my sister and brother-in-law and his family are there. Like, I don't think I we'll can support that. We'll just burn Wrigleyville and, like, a little parts of downtown. That's it. You'll, your brother-in-law and your sister will be fine. Oh and I just God. patted your... Like, I won't get on board with okay. destroying my own city, but, like, I'll get down. <laughs> like, the city will get down. <laughs> I went to the Blackhawks parade um, in 2010. What was that like? That, we got down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brought, brought a bottle of champagne. Some guy had to open it with his teeth. Yes. Um. That's awesome. Had, yeah. Really should have thought about bringing a corkscrew thing. But the streets, like, they looked trashed, and then they got cleaned up like really quick. I saw a lot of like rambunctious teenagers who were like hammered. Some guy like climbed a pole and like yep. got the banners down. I thought he was gonna fall. It was kind of scary, but like. Honestly, it was really just a lot of people having fun. The one thing I will say that made me really upset, and Jacob, I don't know if you see this, like, being in the Chicago area. I always see it when I'm home. Obviously, I'm, like, not really into bandwagon fans. But when I went to the Cup Parade in 2010, I was so excited when they played Chelsea Dagger. And my good friend Kim and I, who I went with, we were the only people near us who knew all the words. And I thought that that was like really upsetting. <laughs> bandwagon fan, bandwagon fans really piss me off because the analogy I always use it's like the kids who skip every single ta- uh, every single day of class and then show up to the exam with all the notes, acting like they've been there the whole time when you yeah, put like, in all the work and you've done all the handwritten shit. Yeah, like, it pisses me off so much. Well, you guys wouldn't I feel, appreciate I feel me as a way. classmate because I was the kid that just showed up for the tests and got A's. You're a douchebag. <laughs> they yeah. should have made the class harder. No, like, I can appreciate new fans, but, like, the kids who just want to, like, party, like, I, I get it, but at the same time, I'm like, you're annoying, so it's like a... Right, and I can appreciate the people, I appreciate the people who jump, like, who go into the playoffs, and then they're like, oh, I just started watching this playoffs, and then they come around for next season, and then they're like, I'm, they're right. into it from... I appreciate that, but I don't like the people who, like you said, just just show up, 
for the playoffs and then want to party like the rest of the people who've been there since October. I do. I, I am assuming that like obviously I, I couldn't go to the cup parade like this past year because I was in Philly, but mm-hmm. I'm assuming that like a lot of the fans like it was unreal, insane. Like from what I saw on TV, like this this yeah. past summer, I'm assuming a lot of those people like became fans from 2010. So I mean that is like good. Yeah. Considering that like ticket prices are only climbing in Chicago and it's impossible to go to a regular season game. Um, it's so damn expensive. It's literally ridiculous. How much it's, is it? Oh, you can't get seats for under a hundred dollars. Yeah, I get a hundred. I, I paid a hundred bucks for three hundred level tickets to the Blues Blackhawks game uh, in October. Wow, it's and ridiculous. It was, then add yeah. parking. You're gonna have a couple beers. Let's get real. Yeah, it's a it's like it's a all out event if you're going it, it like it I mean it's fun if you do get to go but like everyone's always like Marina why do you only go to playoff games I'm like because they're the same price as regular season games like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're so it's so much more fun yeah exactly well what's it like going to a playoff game in St. Louis or Chicago I can only tell you what it's like to go to one in New York and it's two things simultaneously it's palpably anxious and deafeningly loud. It's like everybody is waiting for something to either go horribly wrong or, or awesomely right. And they're going to respond with the same amount of deafening noise. Either way, it's just a matter of it's going to be a positive or a negative noise. And, and you could feel at Madison Square Garden or Yankee Stadium, you could feel the arena shake a little when a goal gets scored or a home run is hit or whatever. I haven't been to a, a playoff game in so long, but I can tell you that it's definitely loud and it's definitely rowdy. Like Scott Trade gets really rowdy, especially now that we're actually good in the playoffs. Like we well yeah. decently good in the playoffs. I feel like as the closer we get, like the further we get in the playoffs, the more and more that anxious sort of energy is going to flow into the arena because we haven't been there in so long. Marina, I, I got a question for you. What's up? Of all the Europeans, why the Russians? Kind of like what I said before. I don't really know. I have, I, I don't know what it is with me, but I'm, I've always been like fascinated with like other cultures. I'm like maybe the worst American you've ever met. Like, I just <laughs> like want to be something else because I don't know. Like, like I was a tomboy when I was younger. And then, like, as, like, I am now, I'm constantly, like, let me learn this other language. Like, let me embrace this and that. I think, like, with Russia, you know, what I really, really like about them is their work ethic. And you talk to people who are from, like, the country or, like, if it's about hockey or something, and you just get a sense that, like, it's all that they breathe. And and I feel like in America things can be so like nonchalant and passive and it's a big part of your life. But there's like that dedication like that I, I don't think we always match that like the Russians have. And maybe it's just because of that like communist rule and like dictatorship or something. I don't really know. But um, I'm really drawn to that. And it it uh, it's like it's like a grittiness or something. And I, I, I really appreciate it. So, I don't know. I, I notice it with Russia, I guess, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, that all makes no, perfect, that makes sense. perfect sense. Yeah, it really does. That's wonderful. It's like... Don't, um, don't stop. I always reference, you know, I, I'm sure you guys saw 24-7 the first time around with Bruce Boudreau in the yep. room. And he and he says yep. this, the quote, you know, if... <laughs> I'm going to fuck it up now because I'm, like, on the spot. But, uh, you know, don't just think you want it. Like, go out and fucking want it. And it's, it's like, yep. so true. And I get, like, really motivated when I think that way. Like, yeah. Like, you, you have to want it with every part of your being. Yes. And I, I always feel like Russian hockey is, is that way. It's kind of um, instilled in you. And and that's something that I like, you know, like I aspire to be like. So in my own like personal life, I get inspired to be better through that. Passionate dedication. Yeah. 
But that's what it's about. That's how you achieve things in life. I, I'm joking when I said earlier that I was the guy that showed up for the tests and, and got A's. I mean, I wasn't quite like that, but school was easy for me. Everything else has been really difficult. And this podcast, the website, has been an absolute grind, and I'm living and breathing it 24-7. Jake and I are constantly going back and forth with ideas for everything. I probably text or email him the most at anybody by a factor of about 100. <laughs> and, and, and it's fine, and, but that's what I want. That's the kind of focus and drive that the successful people talk about, and it comes from within. And to recognize that in others and to aspire to be that and to try to work in a similar manner, that only leads to success because it won't just lead to direct success by performing the actions needed in order to be successful. It'll help you be humble and learned so that you can evolve on the fly. When, when we get real inside talk from people who are successful in, in all walks of life. They grind and they push and they struggle and their focus doesn't waver. If anything, it grows stronger. So th that you, that you recognize this in Russian culture is, is apt. I was reading an article, and I think I sent this to both of you, about uh, Malkin's... Oh, it was such a great article. Oh, thank you. Not that I wrote it, but I'm glad that you enjoyed it. <laughs> but it's about... Glad to take the credit. Well, I'm happy that you were happy. I'm happy to have shared I'm, it I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. I'm giving you a hard no, time. It's, no, it's fine. Good. Give it to me. But Magnetogorsk seems to provide this sort of mindset for its people. Oh, absolutely. Like, reading about Malkin, like, knowing that, like, it's hockey or factory, mm -hmm. just being like, hey, you have to get up at, like, six every day, and you're just like, okay, I can do that. Like, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. That's so, like, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that stems back even before it was USSR, and they were having the Olympic players being the, uh, like, it was either play at the Olympic hockey or be a soldier, and that was your only two options. Right. Right, right. In baseball, and gosh, I hope I get this country correct. I believe it's both Taiwan uh, or Chinese Taipei and South Korea that it's either baseball or military from like 18 to 21. I know that in Israel, you have to serve for two years between a certain, I think it's like between 18 and 25. So... These are real motivations that people face, and it's not always just abject poverty. Like I think that it's something that, like, as Americans, we we don't really have to face. Like, we, we overcome adversity in our own ways, but it's not, like, as oppressive, I think. Yes. As, like, other yep. countries, like, experience it. You reach a point in your life at some point, hopefully earlier, uh, rather than later, where you start to develop more of a keen eye for perspective on yourself, what you grew up in, what you're surrounded by, and what others are surrounded by. And you have to figure out that drive. You have to figure out how to wake up in the morning and embrace the grind. Yeah. To accomplish whatever it is that you either need to or want to or both. Well, and it has to come from, like, some kind of, like, intrinsic motivation, I think, too. Mm -hmm. It can't just be, oh, like, yeah. external motivators. Like, these people who, you know, like, watching the Olympics, it, I always get, like, so emotional because you know how bad, that like, they want it. Like, you don't just get up at all hours, work that hard, unless you, like, really want it. Like, not because somebody else is, like, forcing you to, you know? Right, exactly. I definitely think that you are the only person that can tell you what you do or do not want. People tell you you can do it. That's not the same as you saying, oh, I want this. Yeah. And that's what all these people are doing is that you, you're the only one. You have to have that inner drive if you want to do anything. Because if you don't have that drive, then you're not going to, you're not going to want it as much as and somebody else who really does want it is going to completely surpass you. I agree with that. The trick is being able to turn the grind into a piece of motivation, the struggle into a piece of achievement. 
And when you learn to live within a certain amount of frustration or pain, in whatever form that comes in, you're able to take that, use it as fuel and perspective so that you can keep going. And I say this, it's not as a person who has accomplished a lot, but the very you know, existence of this podcast is one thing off my bucket list I've been wanting to do since I was 15. And Jake and I haphazardly kind of put it together, but fuck it, we did it. What were you going to say? And that was here. It's great. Yeah. Marina, what were you going to say? I was going to say, um, what you were saying reminds me, um, have you guys ever heard of like TED Talks? Yes, I watch them every day. Yes. Yeah, um, I don't, so I had, I, don't. To, I had to watch this TED Talk for um, one of my counseling courses. The woman who did it, her name escapes me right now. But it was the, about the, the grind. It was, it was about grit. Yes, grit. Um, yeah, and sh- she's actually coming to my university um, to talk. Um, That's awesome. And, uh, but, I, but I watched her TED Talk, and I, I, I was envisioning, like, athletes. Because, like, this concept of grit, you know, like, comes from basically, like, wins and losses. And when you think of, like, great people who have succeeded, like, they've also failed. And it, like, it all comes down to, like, it it depends on, like, kind of what you were saying. Like, you have to, like, persevere and, like, move past it and then you'll succeed because you really want it. And even though, like, you fail, you don't necessarily give up. You, You work harder and you find, like, the inner drive to reach your goal, even if it takes you a couple of years or however long, you know? Angela Lee Duckworth, the key to yes, success. Yes, that's the name. Grit. Yes, I remember watching this. I have it saved on my phone. Actually, I have about a dozen saved on my phone. It's a great one. It, it yeah, absolutely is. That's kind of like what Michael Jordan said. He said... Yeah, it was one of his commercials cool where he went through all the numbers in which he has failed, all the all his losses all the missed shots, all the last-minute misses, and he ends it with, and that is why I succeed. Oh, that's good. I haven't Damn seen it. that. You stole my thunder, Igor. I'm, I'm sorry, but I eat <laughs> all this up. I, I, have, I have a folder. You know, like, isn't that why you love sports? Because, yes. because your yes. favorite athlete fails, you see them cry, and yeah. you just can't, you can't help but like, relate to them and understand like it makes it so much better. It absolutely is. Matt yeah. McElroy was telling us a couple episodes ago about what it was like to see the Ottawa Senators leave in tears uh, during the cup final. Right. And that good. More- good. They care, you know, like, yeah. And that's like, I'm yeah. trying with see. my team too. <laughs> yeah. And that's usually what we see when, when I think about in particular, the Ranger Stanley cup victory. What I remember most is all the Canucks sitting on their side of the rink in just a slump of exhaustion and utter sadness and trying to hold it together. I was talking to Jake and and Joe Pack, I guess last week now, why I want Peyton Manning's jersey, and it's because of his post-game press conference this past Super Bowl. When he was asked if he was embarrassed by the result, he just kept, he said, no, that's insulting. We've put six months or nine months of, of effort into the season. Look at what we accomplished. We won our division. We won 12 games. We we represented our conference. We went to the Super Bowl. All the different trials and tribulations that we went through, like, quite frankly, the word embarrassment is an insult to what we've accomplished so far this season. And he did it with his jaw quivering and holding and not shedding a single tear. Seriously, I have a folder on my desktop and on my phone. It's called Moto, short for Motivations, where when I am feeling beat up, I will pop on one of these and I'll listen to it on loop for a little while. I literally do that, but just with the Bruce Boudreaux speech. <laughs> oh, which, which one is that? <laughs> well, the, the locker room speech from oh, Point okay. Yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Mine's oh, all music I related. I like, uh, what is it? My two big things are one song I'm busting out right now is it's a song called Sometimes You're the Hammer, Sometimes You're the Nail. And the yeah. lyrics are I wanna be a better person, I wanna know the master plan, cast your stones, cast your judgment, you don't make me who I am. And I love that line. It's good. Him fucking straight. I really like that line. And that's like that's the big motivational for me right now is fuck what everybody else thinks. I'm gonna do what I want and I'm gonna make my own path and they don't like it, go screw them. They're not going to be around in 10 years when it really matters. 
Exactly. Or I wonder if Yulia Kovalchuk listens to that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good trend. That was a bad, that was a bad joke, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. a great joke. I'm looking up Bruce Boudreaux's locker room rant. Oh, I watch it, like, all the time. Like, especially when I have something, like, big I need to do. What else do you use as motivation, Marina? Honestly, like, I use myself, and my mom is, like, a big inspiration to me with all the stuff she's gone through. I know what I want in life, usually, and I kind of have to tell myself, (laughs) it just goes back to the Bruce Boudreaux thing. Like, if you want it, you have to go out and get it. Like, you can't assume that things will line up and that if it's meant to be it'll be like that's a bunch of bullshit like if you straight you have to go out and get it like you can't and like um like i was telling you like before we got on like i i applied at like a bunch of phd programs i got placed as an alternate at marquette um but i didn't get into any of the other schools and like that sucks so i got my fingers crossed for one school if I really want to get my PhD, then I have to go and reapply again, like in another couple of years. And not getting in can't be a deterrent. Like it has to be motivation. If you want it something that bad, then like you have to fight for it. You can't just say, you know, it didn't work out. It wasn't meant to be. Fuck that. Yeah. yeah. Well, with like this past week with uh, my personal life, and I, I think I got dumped. I'm not really sure. Oh but, no. Uh, I cried to my mom and, and, and she told me a bunch of things and, and but at the end of the day I, I, I kind of told her because she's like well maybe you shouldn't have done this or that and you know you give your heart away too easily and, and I told her I was like well you know I, I'd rather do these things um, and try if I, if I really want something to work and like I don't try like that's stupid like, yes like, why would I do it half-ass and pretend yes. that, like, it's going to work out? Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, like, Zero. in everyday life. Why would it make sense, like, in your love life? Like Exactly. It doesn't. And I feel, like, really heartbroken right now and that, like, sucks. But at least I can tell myself, like, I don't regret anything that I did. So what do I have to be mad about? Like, you live, you learn, and you get back up, and you go do it again. Like Exactly. And if it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But, like, at the end of the day, a lot of things don't fucking work. <laughs> um, you know, but, I, uh, I, I, got one, I got one for you. And, Jake, I don't know if I've told you this particular anecdote. So if you're lost, I'll tell you off air, okay? That's so, right. I'll, I'll pay attention. <laughs> So with my last relationship at the end of it, uh, my hair was falling out and my stomach was always in a knot. I was, I was like constantly constipated and constantly in general cramps. Like I had, like I, I had trouble stretching out my legs. I was just, I was under just all this excessive stress. And when I look back on it, I'm really proud of myself for enduring that for three months. Because it means that I have the fortitude to go through something until I can no longer do it. I broke up with her the very moment that I said, I cannot bear another moment of this. And I was able to hang on through all that bullshit to try to make it work. And I probably shouldn't have. But I tested myself and I went through it. And I did the same sort of thing when I had to drop out of college because I had a horrible, massive concussion. I had a Brett Lindros, an Eric Lindros size concussion without joke, without exaggeration. And I stayed in school with a full schedule between 16 and 20 credits. That fall semester, the following spring, the following summer, and into the following fall again. And I stuck with it. And I tried until I couldn't do it anymore. And I didn't get a lot of credits, and I used up a lot of time and money, but I fucking tried. I fucking gave it until I couldn't give anymore. And when I look back on it, I couldn't be more proud of myself. I grew those experiences, if not more, than any success I've had, any abstract or abject success. So these struggles, man, that's half of what it's all about. All right. I agree one 100% 100% with you. It's all about it's all about what you fight through and what you fight for that makes you who you are today. Yes. 
Yes. That is how you become the person as you are is based off of – it's all about going out there and doing something about it. You may as well fall flat on your ass, but hell, you gave it the best fucking shot that you could, and that alone is much better than – any, if you just would have sat there, even like I, the best thing I like to say is always shoot for the moon because even if you miss, you're still among the fucking stars because it means yeah, that, boy, and go for it because even if you don't succeed, you're still a hell of a lot farther along than you would have been had you not even tried it at all. Mm-hmm. What's up, Marina? Oh, I was gonna say it Sorry. reminds me of that like quote. No, you're fine. Um, it was I I have it written on my like cork board. Ever tried? Ever failed? No matter, try again, fail again, like fail better or some. I totally messed it up. Now it's bad, <laughs> but it's it's basically saying like it's okay, like do it again, like fa- like literally fail better. Yeah, that's all, like that's great. Like like you uh, said, really you have like to fall, you have to like fail, fall flat on your face, and maybe you do it twice, maybe you do it three times, like but that's okay. Um, I think that that's why, uh, obviously I'm like, you guys, I don't know if you know, I'm like obsessed with Bruce Boudreaux. <laughs> um, like if you read his book, I, it's funny. I have a favorite NHL coach. Yeah. Um, it's really cool, <laughs> but you, but no, no, I, I, I highly recommend his book. It's called like Gabby confessions of a hockey lifer. Um, but you read it and you really get a sense of who he is and he, he blatantly like states, "I'm, I'm the Columbo of coaching. Like I'm not sexy. Like they don't want to hire me because I'm not fit and I don't look good in a suit. You know, like." But he says, "Like I love hockey and I'm passionate about it. And I was a shitty player and I learned from that. Like I was, like I was, like he was good, but he didn't like dedicate himself. And he like realized that. And he says that like that's why he thinks he's such a good coach." And, like, when I see, like, people get mad, I was cheering for the Ducks when they played the Blackhawks. Um, and it's because it's cause I love Bruce and, like, what he stands for. And, like, you know, you, you, you see what he did with the Capitals when he got called in in, like, 2007 or whatever. And, like, how he, like, flipped the team around. And, and you know, he still doesn't want a Stanley Cup. But you just keep tracking because you know that, like, it's something that you want and it's something that, like, you can do. And you look at his success and you're like, shit. You know? Mm-hmm. Fucking love Brucey. <laughs> I've never met somebody who had mm-hmm. a favorite coach, but now I'm tempted to find one myself. <laughs> my my friends always give me a hard time. They're like, you have a crush on Bruce Brudrell and Evgeny Malkin. I think Malkin's good looking personally, but people give me the hardest time <laughs> for those two. Ah, oh, man. Rock it. Rock what you find. Oh, I rock it. I, I, I love them. It's like, I will stand behind Obi. them. It's better than what? You said it's better than saying Ovi. Ovi. Oh, you guys don't like Ovi? Well, I, I have no stake in this race. He's He's got a little salt and pepper going on. Yeah, like but a, listen, like when, you, when you're the Ovi captain... Like you took too many sticks to the face. I, I love a toothless mouth, and sometimes it's okay when um, they're also bald. Is it toothless, or is it a gap? It's cute either way. It's endearing. <laughs> Ever you know tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Samuel Beckett, that's awesome. Yeah, I like that one. I think that hockey does like does well with a personality like Ovi, where he has that gap and he <laughs> is Russian and puts parentheses <laughs> on everything, and <laughs> that's great. Me and Matt have talked about how much we like the personalities in Oh, yeah. And hockey. We think hockey needs more personalities. For sure. I agree. No, the whole, the parenthesis thing, apparently my ex now, but he's Ukrainian, he would send all those parentheses and texts to me. And I, I don't know if it's like an Eastern European thing, but it's not just Ovechkin. So whatever the parentheses mean, like, it's a Russian-Ukrainian thing, I guess. Marina... You write for the Hockey Writers. Yep. <laughs> you have written two awesome articles. Well, one, thank you. You're welcome. One called The Future of Suspensions, Implementing By Law 17. Yep. And the one we're going to talk about, In Loving Memory, Athletes and Death Adjustment. 
Yeah, so what sparked me writing this article was I happened to have a phone conversation with my mom, and she tries to bring up hockey whenever she can with her little knowledge. And she asked me if I heard about Patrick Kane's grandfather passing away. And I I did, and um, February happens to be the anniversary of a lot of deaths for me personally. And so um, the subject of, like, death just kind of, like, really popped into my head. And I was reminded... um, about Thomas Tatar uh, losing his father um, back in January, and I remember hearing about that and just being so heartbroken. So I kind of went into the literature because my field is counseling. So um, I just I went online and I started looking up, you know, like motivation and death. Like how do these athletes overcome death when they're playing on this big stage? You know, like for for so many people, death just becomes this giant hurdle to overcome, and, and you, you kind of become paralyzed by the impact of it and because it's so overwhelming and upsetting and all those other things. I ended up finding this article that talked about, like, death adjustment, which is basically how people adjust, I guess, like, when, when they're confronted with death and whether that death be, um, like, more metaphorical or real – But kind of like when mortality issues like come to the forefront of your mind and um, in the article, they said that the best predictor of having like a healthy psyche, like um, a a big predictor of that is having um, a sense of high self-esteem. So if you have a high self-esteem, you're more likely to not, you know, deal with mental illness or like depression or something when confronted with these losses. I basically tied it all together writing this article by saying these these guys went through really traumatic losses in their life, um, people that were really important to them. In the next game, they performed really well, and that's, you know, that's remarkable, really commendable on their part to, you know, just be willing to play for their team after um, sustaining such a loss. But basically, it's it's just like, how did they do that? And as, you know, you can kind of guess – Professional athletes have a higher sense of self-esteem. You don't get to the NHL by being good. You get to the NHL by being, we as fans can criticize players all the time and say that you're awful and like, how, how are you even playing? You know, go back to the AHL or whatever you want to say. You're irrelevant. These players got where they are by being coached and being told that they're pretty great and that their skill level is, is really high. And, and when you get that kind of reinforcement, you know, it, it contributes to your self-esteem and, you know, like how you think of yourself. So in a real way, in a tangible way, rather, the memory of them lives on through their performance and they dedicate a segment of their performance in the honor and memory of whomever they lost. Yeah. And I mean, and that's, and that's just coming from me. That's not coming from the research article I, I looked into. I definitely think that there could be so much more research done on motivation and loss the professional like sports realm because I I really couldn't find anything that related it to sports but um, finding motivation in sports is obviously um, something that's really important and my professor I worked with in undergrad he actually um, he was a sports psychologist in the Olympics during the 1990s and he he always told me that intrinsic motivation is really the most important and it kind of makes sense when you think about loss, because if you want to play for somebody or through somebody or whatever, that's intrinsic motivation. It's it's not for something where you're going to get anything like, like you said, like, tan- I don't know, like out of it, I guess. I don't know if I make any sense ever, but. <laughs> no, you make quite a bit of sense and we're all going to learn from it. I just thought it was like something to put the highlighter over, you know, really commend these guys on their efforts I don't know I I, I think it's great that they um, they were able to be successful and and not get like down because the last thing you want to see is you know one of your favorite athletes having a hard time certainly there's little more frustrating when you can see that the athlete lost their confidence and what that does to their game it's almost uh, why be out there, but that's part of the divide between the fans and the players that the fans don't know what the, what the player is dealing with. Yeah. And that's a lot of what I hope for in 24 seven starts to come through is that we really do get to learn what these players are going through 
what their emotions are and what's rattling around between the years. Unfortunately, we don't usually get that, but that's another conversation. I think that that is why I am so drawn to 24-7 or this, like, this little segment of NHL Revealed because you kind of get that glimpse into the everyday struggle. And so you kind of, like, get why maybe they picked a fight or – do you know what I mean? Yeah, 7 o'clock, and I know that you need to get to school. So (laughs) – I want to say thank you both thank for you. you're welcome and thank you yep, for thank coming you very on. much. Thank you for contributing to the blog. It was a fantastic article. We look forward to what you have in store for us next. Um, thank you for giving us a couple hours of your time this afternoon. It's been wonderful. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. And um, if you guys ever want to chat, I'm always around. So. Yeah, I think we can have you on again. I, I think we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I, think I, ho- I hope that. it makes sense. You know, I, I, I always think that I'm talking and it makes sense, and then I'm like, it probably makes sense to no one. <laughs> well, listen, if you start speaking Russian, we might have a language barrier. But if you stick to English, baby, I think we got you. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not too good at speaking Russian, so you don't have to worry about that. But they, but thank you. Yep. If you want to find me on Twitter, my handle is Marina Mill at Marina Mill. So it's M A R I N N A M I L. My own like personal hockey blog is at X O K K E I uh, dot com, which is a Russian play on words of the word hockey. And yeah, that's probably the best way to get at me. All right. Thanks again to Marina. Remember, you can find Jacob at Jacob underscore born and myself at Matt Riegler, R-I-E-G-L-E-R, both on Twitter. Feel free to hit us anytime at borntopuck at gmail.com. Please subscribe and remember to chirp what you love.